Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris here with you for another week. It's the first Monday of the month, which means it's Request Monday. Fear Factories Demanufacture, going back to 1995. But before we go back to 1995, Chris, how are you, my man? Very good. Um, I, man, I, I didn't real. I don't even think I really looked <laughs> to see what year this came out. 1995, we were 13. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And uh, it's funny, when you listen to it, it kind of has that sound for some of the bands that were coming up around that time. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, did you have a chance to catch up on all the stuff that you said you were going to listen to last week? I did. Um, in fact, I pretty much put most of it on my latest playlist, which I posted um, just the other day. It's on our um, – we have a, a bunch of playlists on our Spotify. I added um, – your most recent one as well. Um, man, I have to say, this is my 14th playlist so far this year. Um, might be one of my favorites. There's a lot of cool new songs. Um, I don't know. Have we talked about the the new Arch Enemy single in the Eye of the Storm? No. No, actually, I haven't heard it. How is it? It's awesome. Like, I, I don't know, man. Like, I, I always try to convince myself that I'm like... I don't care that much about Arch Enemy, but then I hear their songs and I'm like, man, this is good shit. Like good, just pretty much straightforward melodic death metal. I know we talked about um, Elisa doing uh, clean vocals on one of the other singles. Um, None of that here, uh, but really just catchy. Like I I, I was digging this and in the same vein, the, the new soil work single dreams of nowhere, which actually I'm not sure had any, growls or death vocals in it um i'm I'm, both of these albums i'm actually really looking forward to hearing um i also mentioned to you um empress has a new single eventide man i've listened to this a bunch of times this i think might be one of the surprise albums of 2022 i think they have one i can't remember if they have one full-length album prior to this or this is going to be their first full-length album i know they're playing at Mad With Power in Wisconsin at the end of uh, August. But um, I've been very impressed with what I've heard so far, and the new single, Eventide, is uh, really good. Um, I, mean, I could go on and on, but um, there's just a lot of a lot of good stuff. Um, I think it was all mentioned last week. Um, you you'd mentioned the new El Wadey single. Um, that is incredible. I think that's really good. Um, Annette Olsen is shows up on the playlist twice because <laughs> um, there's a track with her and the Japanese band Ultima Grace and as well as a new single with her and Russell Allen, which is awesome because it's not one of those tracks where only one of them sings. It actually is both of them. Um, the new Nordic Union tune is awesome. Um, I was very interested in the new Ascendia song, which sounded like they're definitely trying to get onto the radio. Yes, it, it, it's definitely – it's funny you mentioned that. Um, they have definitely changed their sound. Um, I don't know if this track is maybe an outlier or if the whole album is this way. It's going to be a very interesting listen. I'm, I'm curious to hear the whole I, thing. When I heard it, I was like, oh, my God, Ascendia has turned into a band that Mike is going to love. And I sent it to him, and he's like, this is great. So, yeah, yep, yep. yep. <laughs> I, I, so, I totally hear you. And yeah. um and then, then the new and then the new singles from Threshold and Voyager also just to cap things off. I mean I basically just read almost the entire playlist, but um I just really liked all of these songs that came out recently and uh and the new Megadeth single with Ice featuring Ice T of all things. The, um, the, the 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 collaboration that you've never imagined but never realized you could I know. I'm really to. hoping that this will lead to Dave Mustaine ending up on Law and Order SVU. Uh, <laughs> uh that that would definitely be interesting. Um it's funny. I uh I, I cannot impress upon people enough. Definitely check out the Spotify page. We have a bunch of playlists up there and if you're looking just to kind of catch up on either new things or just kind of get a sense of some of the stuff that we've been listening to lately that maybe we haven't mentioned on the podcast it's a good place to go. And, and if not, it's just a good eclectic mix of music. So uh, cheers, cheers, and, and thanks for, for keeping that up. 
I, I'd be yeah, there's also there's a there's a Steve Winwood and a Collective Soul song on my latest playlist as well. So I said eclectic. I did say eclectic. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to mention just two bands myself. Um, the new Oceans of Slumber album came out uh, about a week ago. Starlight and Ash. This is a really interesting album. I don't know if you've followed this band's career over over the years. I thought their self titled release from um, two years ago was very very good. This is a little bit different. It's very doomy in certain areas, um, but the vocal lines are just so good on top of some of these songs. I, I really was impressed. I think it's probably going to wind up somewhere in the top 50. I just don't know where and what the staying power will be, but I, I highly recommend that album. And finally, uh, a band out of Portugal, a melodic death metal band called Moonshade, released their latest album called As We Set the Skies Ablaze. Uh, something, I guess, in the Omnium Gatherum realm, if you will. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. Uh, they This is their second full-length release. Uh, their last album was about four years ago. Definitely worth checking out. I'll try to post a track from them as well. Worth, worth a listen for sure. But without any further ado, let's get to the reason why we are here. Fear Factory, Dean Manufacture, 1995. And I want to be as clear as clear can be. I think prior to listening to this album a bunch of times this week, I don't think I've heard more than like a song by this band. And it might've been once. I'm not even sure if I've ever heard them. I really, um, this was uncharted waters for me. I'm wondering if you had heard, I'm sure you've heard the name, but had you heard this band prior to this week? I don't think so. I mean, I definitely had heard of them. Um, they were on the mortal Kombat uh, soundtrack from the film that came out in the, uh, late 90s, I believe, mid to late 90s. Um, uh, uh, Zero Signal, which I think is the third song on this uh, album, was on that Mortal Kombat uh, soundtrack. And um, But uh, no, I mean, I just knew that they kind of were somewhat of a big deal in like that kind of mid to late 90s kind of industrial metal kind of uh, thing. But, you know, obviously that was not um, an area that we were very well versed in at all. Um, so yeah, I think for both of us, this was a, um, a very, uh, ear opening experience. I I found it interesting that this was recorded in Woodstock, New York (laughs) of of all places. Right. And apparently while they were recording this album, Bon Jovi was in the studio as well. And they asked, Apparently, as the story goes, Bon Jovi asks the band to turn down the volume a little bit because it was so loud that it was <laughs> impacting the drum recording on the Bon Jovi release. I, I have a feeling he they, they probably told him to go fuck himself. But I, again, I'm just paraphrasing here. I, I don't know the I don't know for sure, but it is it is a funny story because the two bands sound absolutely nothing alike. And 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 this is you know obviously Bon Jovi just, you know, three or four years removed from their absolute peak of popularity, uh, you know, in the, in the late eighties and early nineties. That is something I did not know. And I won't ever forget. I've learned a lot today. I learned that hook is Taz's son. And I learned (laughs) that fear factory interfered in a Bon Jovi recording in Woodstock, New York. Uh, it is a day for uh, weird trivia facts. <laughs> you, you try to learn something new every day, and you're covered through the rest of the week. So I, I think you're you're off to a great start. Yeah. Well, between that and I also discovered some absolutely hilarious songs that were somebody made on YouTube about ten years ago using clips from Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. Um, I. That made my week. I'll have to send those your way because I was in tears. I was laughing so hard at like this guy made music and just used like voice clips from Arnold Schwarzenegger movies to like do the vocals and how he did it so well. I will never know, but it's absolutely hilarious. Well, first of all, I want to hear that as soon as we're done. Second (laughs) of all, it's funny you mentioned that because this album was actually based off the Terminator series. So another, I, I, did, another, I, I did that on purpose. I, I really wanted this to be a smooth segue. So the, I, it, it couldn't have been any smoother. I, I had absolutely no idea about these songs. So you'll have to send them. As I said, um, this, this request comes to us from Keith Nickel, a mutual friend, a uh, recent friend of ours, or at least a recent friend of mine, uh, go Braves. We're about two and a half out at this point. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting ahead of the Mets in, in the near future. 
Uh, you want to just not, say a not little if bit the about Mets what, keep playing the Yankees. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. That it is true. I think they just got the brooms out. But um, why don't you read uh, read uh, what he had to say about this? Because uh, I know this album meant a lot to him. Yeah. So Keith is um, right now gallivanting across Europe. Uh, he went and saw Rammstein um, at, at, a couple of times, I believe. Just like uh, he's on like the the ultimate European road trip right now. So. Uh, um, I'm hoping he'll get to listen to this uh, while he's still over there. That sounds like a super cool trip. Yeah, I got a message from actually earlier today that he'll be um, heading to England a week from tomorrow. So uh, he's he's really making his way around. But um, he ha- he said um, for starters, it's one of the pioneering albums of clean slash death vocal combinations, if not the album that started it. The first five songs hit so hard. Then you get a bit of a break in the middle to calm yourself with the next three songs. Then the final three songs are just as good in some regards as the first five. It really feels like a three-act structure in that way. This is my favorite album of all time because nothing is wasted and the majority of the album is incredible. The title track, self Bias Resistor, Zero Signal, Replica, and HK are mandatory inclusions in my top 20 best Fear Factory songs list. This band has been lost to time, unfortunately, due to all the legal issues they've had lately and not being able to capitalize on their 90s success in the 2000s. My favorite song off Demanufacture is Zero Signal, which is 100% the best Fear Factory song. The doom sounds at the beginning, the galloping bass drum, then that riff that just makes you want to start thrashing your body around. (laughs) Plus, it was in arguably the best fight scene in the 1995 Mortal Kombat film. And that's how I got introduced to them in the first place. So that's those are Keith's uh, thoughts on this album that he chose. Uh, we figured we'd throw him a bone since we um, just refused to do Saint Anger uh, despite his repeated requests. So uh, I'm thinking that you're probably going to be reviewing this album similarly. However, <laughs> um, how do I start? L- let me start this way. This was a fascinating blend of genres. Obviously, the industrial influences were very strong. I heard alternative, you know, mid-90s alternative influences, although obviously not in the vocal stylings. But really, I I hear a lot of melodic death metal or what would ultimately become like melodic death metal akin to a lot of the Swedish bands like At The Gates uh, that were doing similar stuff around this time, albeit 6,000 miles away. Um, and, and what was interesting is, you know, to Keith's point, I think the, gra- the, the, the harsh vocals dominate the album. But then you go into these passages of clean vocals, and, and I'll mention some of them as we kind of go through the songs a little bit. But some of these clean passages were w- was almost like hearing almost like an Aussie clone or – something in that vein on certain tracks all of a sudden appear out of nowhere. And then they would just go back into that brutal, brutal, brutal um, verse in most cases. It was very, very different. And I have to be completely honest with you. The first time I played this, I think I was so taken back and and this is taken back. I I listened to a lot of aggressive stuff. I listened to black metal. I listened to death metal. I love melodic death metal, but I listened to the first, listened to this for the first time, and I don't even think I could get wrap my head around it. I just didn't know how to make heads or tails of it, and it wasn't the industrial aspect of it. I, I just, for some reason, I just couldn't. I wasn't prepared for the onslaught that this album was. The next two listens, I finally started to understand what it was about, and I just absolutely freaking hated it. I mean, I hated it, and like I said to myself. This is, I, I don't know how I can listen to this anymore. And, and as I'm listening to it, I'm saying, and, and I, 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 I said to myself, it's only Tuesday. I, I have, I have to get through this thing. I wound up listening to it a, a few more times and I have to be honest, it did grow on me a little bit. So I'm not going to slander the whole thing like I was planning to after that third listen. Um, but I, I, I can't say that I don't love the modern melodic death metal feel a little bit more just because I thought the songwriting was a little bit better. I think the guitar work here is second to none. And so is the drumming. I just don't love the vocals and I'll let, let's get into the band because we haven't mentioned them yet. Burton Bell on lead vocals, uh, Raymond Herrera on drums, Christian Wolbers on, on bass, or there's some little, uh, we'll say, um, 
I don't know. There's a question as to who actually did the bass uh, tracks on the album. Uh, Dino was Fataris. What was that? I think it was Sting. I it very well might have been. Uh, Dino Cazares. Not, not, not from the police, the wrestlers. I, I, th- I think they actually split tracks, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't know. It's Dino Cazares is, is kind of like the, the, the founder of this band. He's the guitar player. He claims that he did the bass on this as well. I have no reason to doubt him. Um, and he is basically the only member of the band that's still in the band. So it, the, the uh, lineup changes, legal problems. Uh, the story goes on forever. I won't get into too much of those details, but it is a fascinating uh, look at this band. And I'll, I'll tell you right at the outset, something that you probably don't know. I remember going to see Gigantor, which was Megadeth's tour that they did with Anthrax and Symphony X and a whole bunch of bands um, back probably about 10 or 12 years ago now, if I'm not mistaken, could be more. And Fear Factory actually played with them, but I just didn't see them. So I, I don't know if it, it would have changed my opinion to catch this live, but I have to ima- imagine that this was a fantastic live band. Oh my God. I was just picturing just like the, how insane, like just a pit full of people would be listening to this kind of music. Like I, 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 I kind of liked it the first time I heard it. And I think maybe for the first time in the history of us doing this podcast, I kind of just maintained the same opinion of it throughout the whole week. Only change really being that I recognized the songs a bit more the more I listened to them. But I thought I liked it just fine from the beginning, and I like it just fine now that I've listened to it a few times. Um, it's it, it's kind of like the sort of thing that I would need to be in a, a certain mood to listen to. It's It was difficult to try to get work done. Well, listening to this because there was a part of me that just kind of wanted to get up and just like headbang it and like <laughs> just thrash about like as if like I was being attacked by a shark. Um, but 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 I guess that's a part of the brilliance, right? Because at the end of the day, music is music moves you, right? And and if you listen to the right ballad, it kind of makes a certain mood. When you listen to this, either you're in a mood or it puts you in a mood, depending on what the case may be. Um, but it makes you want to get up and throw chairs across the room or bang your head or get out a broomstick and pretend you're playing the guitar because that's what <laughs> – I mean this is uh, – maybe I'm just talking out of turn for myself here. But like I, I definitely agree with you. It's You got to be in the right headspace for this. And maybe I wasn't those first couple of listens. But as I kind of got acclimated or got in the right headspace, it definitely grew on me a bit. Yeah. I mean I feel like this is something – while – there's something kind of simplistic and almost like, like, um, I just caveman y and like guttural and just like really just like brass tacks, like just gets like right down to business about it. But, and I know I just did a very poor job explaining that, but, um, at the same time, I feel like this was something that I probably, would have liked to have listened to maybe for like another week, kind of like I did with, um, I think it was with, um, Pain of Salvation's Perfect Element, where like having that extra week to really let it marinate. And mind you, this is a completely different style of music, but I think that like I, I still don't really like, I, I don't have a good feeling for like which songs are which, and it all kind of like melded together for me. And I think that if I'd listened to it a bit more, I might've been able to like differentiate. I'm I'm not even sure like what I would say my favorite song was. I, I, cause I kind of felt like everything was, was good, but nothing really stood out. And I'm, I'm listening to it as we speak. So maybe something will jump out at me. Um, it, it was just interesting. I'm really glad that we listened to it though, because this is like, talk about like a, an era and a style that just completely passed me by like this whole um, kind of like you know, industrial alt metal of like the mid to late '90s was just something that I missed completely, and um, I still haven't seen the Mortal Kombat movie, so maybe that was part of the reason why. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, this was just I, I, I kind of just enjoyed this without enjoying it too much. Like I, I don't know, I wish I had more to say about everything in, in general. Um, I'm just glad that I listened to it because like, it's just something that I missed out on. And, and I say that about a lot of things that we do. Um, 
you know, like, geez, we talked about the first Black Sabbath album, uh, like night and day compared to this. But, you know, it's again, it's it's like that filling in those gaps uh, of of knowledge. Um, I, I just kind of uh, enjoy doing that. So um, I, I'm glad to hear that you ended up liking it more than you thought you would, because like I, I texted you earlier like, this week and I basically. Yeah, I thought this was going to be like a, a pan fest, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 better than that, and I and I appreciate what you're saying about letting things marinate because, like I said, I played this album a lot, and I did it because I wanted to give it its fair shake, and it definitely, it definitely improved um, with time, and and I said to myself, you know, I must be missing something, and I, and I didn't let what I'm about to say influence me, but this album, by and large, has gotten rave reviews by just about everyone, so like they. You know, there, there was they were definitely onto something here. Um, it just maybe took a little while for me to kind of come on board or whatever. The album opens with it with the title track, and right off the bat, you can kind of see what this is going to be. You have these industrial sounding noises, a really really tight bass bass drum sound, and that opening riff. I mean, you just absolutely know what this is. And I know I mentioned Ozzy earlier in terms of like the the, the clean vocals. On this track, I hear the I, Lane Staley from Alice in Chains. I think it's so um, interesting how they're able to take those cleans and then the harsh vocals, which sound nothing like that. Um, the riffs and the drumming here just keep this entire track from going off the rails. And I think that with time, this actually grew on me. This is a very good opening track for what the album is. Yeah, um, I... I just, I, I mean, it really grabs you. The The riffs are so aggressive. The riffs and the drum, the guitar riffs and the drumming right off the bat. It's just a question of once the singing starts, like, are you going to, are you going to stick around or are you going to bail? And if I had heard this when I was a teenager, I probably would have bailed as soon as the vocal started. But I mean, I don't know if it, it's just years of, of, like softening my stance on, on like more aggressive vocals, but the vocals didn't really offend me at all. Like I've heard, you know, melodic death metal bands that have vocalists that I prefer less than, than this. Um, it's, I think I've personally have come a long way in my tolerance of said, vocal style um sure. but i really do enjoy the cleans there's like this kind of echoey like there's just the effect of it is cool it's a really awesome dichotomy uh from the the screams and the growls um just cool it's just cool it's just such a such a different style of anything that i've like really ever listened to um I could completely understand how this was in a movie like a Mortal Kombat. I feel like it probably fit the bill or whatever scene it was in probably perfectly. And now I'm super curious to actually see the part of the movie that this is in that, that Keith referenced. But um, I think that this song is a pretty good representation of what the, the album is on, on a whole. Um and I think it's a really good song. I think Keith's right. Like the first handful of tracks on this album really, really kick your ass right from right from the get go. Yeah, it, it, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. the The second track is actually going to be my song of the week, and that's self um, self bias resistor. The way this starts 
is almost like a progressive thrash sound. And I know that sounds weird to say, but it's definitely thrashy. But the way that eventually those drums kick in, it would like that syncopated drum sound. It actually sounds almost progressive in certain areas, which is all I need to hear. Um, I, it's just a really, really nice touch. And, I, and and unlike a lot of the songs, I think the the chorus here is just a standout chorus it, as compared to some of the other ones. Very, very melodic, a very, very diverse song. And, and quite frankly, it's just so tight with that awesome instrumental section towards the end and the drumming, which is second to none. This is my song of the week. This is my favorite track on the album, hands down. The the guitar work reminds me of Halloween's Revelation from their mm. Better Than Raw album, which yes. was such an outlying Halloween song because they never really used that aggressive guitar style again. Even on Dark Ride, which was a very darker album, that was like – it just i don't know it just dawned on me how much that that opening riff was like oh my god that's like what halloween did that that one time they decided to be like a little bit more aggressive and i wish they yeah. would have explored that a little bit more I'm, i i want to say that was more of roland's influence than wikey's um but um i mean that's probably one of the heaviest the vocals notwithstanding, that's probably one of the heaviest Halloween songs of all oh, yeah. time. And, and it's uh, one of my favorites. I love yeah, that. Yeah, probably one of their most underrated tracks. I would really like to see them tackle that uh, live. Um, but, you know, as an aside, um, I, again, like, this is another really, like uh, like you said, this is another really, like, just heavy, like, really good, heavy song. Um, I think it's a really good choice for your song of the week and and since you chose it i i will not choose it (laughs) (laughs) i like it uh it's the the third track zero single uh, signal we've obviously talked about this kind of starts with this like doomy march meeting this outer space vibe and i actually hear bits of like sound effects that remind me of orion by metallica from from master of puppets which obviously we talked about metallica last week um this this one, I, I noticed the drumming was obviously a little bit different. I can't tell you why, but just the way that he he does his drum fills on this is is a lot different. And it, the drums kind of have like a like a gallop to them. It's like yeah, a boom, yeah, boom, 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 boom. which which is uh, well done. And in in many respects, it actually reminds me of like I said, at the gates um, as the song kind of takes off. Um, very very cool instrumental section, and I can see why they would you know. You know, this is one of their most famous, if not their most famous track because of, of, of you know, what it's been associated with. I'm wondering how much you liked it. Uh, I, I, I'm i with you on, on everything you said. And um, I think Keith really painted a, a really nice picture of it in his blurb from earlier. Uh, and again, it, it makes me very, <laughs> very curious to see this Mortal Kombat movie that Mike has been telling me to see for about 17 years now. <laughs> 27 years how old are we um a lot it's a lot of years uh, i'll just say that uh yeah 27 years um again like i'm I, I, i'm having trouble picking like one song beyond another i feel i find that they're like everything is solid i didn't think anything was any worse or better than the next um, uh, i'll get to that because we, there are some songs there is a We'll get there. I've got some strong okay. thoughts about that. But um, let's talk about New Breed. This has probably the best intro on the well, album, you missed, in my you opinion. missed Replica. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I skipped Replica. Nothing's what it seems to be with you. <laughs> this is interesting because it has like a touch. The, the song's a bit slower in spots. And it actually reminds me, ironically enough, of another band we talked about last week. This reminds me of Pantera in spots. Both the verses and the slowed down riff. But what's awesome about this track is that the chorus actually reminds me a lot of typo negative. So if you have a if you mix the Pantera verses with the typo negative chorus with that just heavy industrial sound in the background, I think that's replica. And it's not my favorite track. I think the clean vocals here are not as good as some of the tracks that we've mentioned prior. Um, but I like I like the blend of those two sounds that you would never think would go together, but somehow it works on, on this track. You know, it's funny. It made me think of Pantera also, and I don't know why because I don't really know Pantera that huh. well. But 
I definitely caught that. I, maybe it just reminded me of Walk, which is the one friggin' Pantera song that I know well. But um, yeah, you're right. I, I'm not. I'm probably even less knowledgeable about typo negative, so I'm going to take your word for it on that one. But um, I, I this was one of the songs I, I liked. Uh, I guess slightly more than the rest. Uh, I'm wrestling with um, whether or not I'm going to make it my song of the week. I, I think this is going to be. I think at the end of this episode, I'm going to pull the song of the week out of my ass along with the album we're listening to next week. So um, <laughs> but I'm just ad-libbing at this point. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, New Breed definitely speeds up where, where Replica slows it down quite a bit. Um, this this is the track that has, in my opinion, just the best intro on the album. It's a sick riff with awesome keyboard effects. And what I love about this song is it's short. It's 100 miles an hour. It's heavy, it's direct, it's in your face, and it just doesn't let up except for like a brief keyboard solo about midway through. I don't love that it's repetitive, but they keep it short that it almost doesn't matter. And what I hear on this track is strapping young lad. If you remember when we talked about City in the archives, this has a feel that City had in certain spots where it was just an absolute onslaught. Um, by Devin in the songwriting, that's what I hear here. Not that it's constructed the same way, but just that brutal, brutal assault. And then they're on to the next track. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good comparison. It's funny because I've had Devin on the brain this week because I feel like um, the new Voyager single, Submarine, towards the end of the song, like it, it goes into like this Devin Townsend-esque kind of vibe. I... I, I I almost want to say that Alex had something to do with that. Um, just uh, totally spitballing there, but um, I totally am getting that vibe as well. Now that you uh, mention it, this is this song to me is if you asked me in 1995, what heavy metal was, <laughs> it'd be this song. That's what I thought metal was and probably what people who don't listen to metal still think metal (laughs) is but like just it just starts out like like just this super aggressive guitar riff guy starts screaming drums are you know flopping around (laughs) like it's it's kind of like the the stereotype for what people think metal is um it it perfectly encapsulated in an under three minute song and and i just love how it's just like get in, get out, like get your aggressions out and, and call it a day. I I'm with you. And though and that kind of wraps up the first side of the album of those first five songs that we talked about. I'm curious about your thoughts about Dog Day Sunrise. Um This is the, the midway point of the album, if you will. And I think the album turns a little bit on this track, and I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um I have been waiting years to hear somebody do a head of David cover, Um, which leads me to my question to you. Who the hell is head of David and why is anyone covering one of their songs? Let let, let me, let me, let me say something. This is, we've done a hundred and what is this? The 107th episode uh, probably covered damn near close to 90 albums at this point, if not more. This is the single worst song that I've heard on any album that we've done. <laughs> I hate this track. This is absolute trash. I don't know why it's on here. I don't have anything good to say about it. The chorus is the worst chorus that I've maybe have ever heard. And, and it's funny because the intro is actually kind of good. So it starts promising and then it falls apart completely. The verses are boring. The chorus is just awful and repetitive. I've got nothing good to say. This is trash and probably the worst song that I've heard in the last two years that we've been doing this. I So apparently um, this band, Head of David, was a British band that um, featured um, an, ex, uh, an ex-member of Napalm Death. Um, I'd be curious um, to see what the original sounds like. Um, I want to be clear about something. There is no way you're picking a Head of David album for next week. I just want to be clear about this. <laughs> Pro- promise me, promise me that well, we're not doing a Head of David album for next week. All right, but we might still be doing a Napalm Death album. Um, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm right. down with Napalm Death. No, yeah, no Head but, of David. Uh, listen, Barney Greenway deserves all the positive praise that he could get. <laughs> um, I mean, 
I probably should have guessed that this was a cover listening to, to it because it really is such an odd song um, compared to the rest of the album. I, I didn't hate it. Um, I, I It's probably one of the the worser i mean if if you're gonna if you're gonna say this is the worst song you're in two years i'm gonna use uh poor english to describe it this was one of the worser songs <laughs> on, on the <laughs> album in my opinion i wasn't i wasn't particularly offended by it i thought like the the chorus was kind of like uh, like drony um and a little bit kind of cheese ball but it also kind of fits the time that it came out with kind of came out in um i presume being that the band that they covered um this uh, made this song in the um let's see i'm trying to figure out when the original version uh came out because the band the band they the head of david like disbanded in like 1991 so it's very possible that this song came out in the 80s so it probably sounds totally different um before it got fear factorized um yeah i mean I, we've probably spent more time on this song than it deserves so we can move on to the next one fantastic um I'd be more than happy to uh next track is called body hammer again a very chunky chunky sounding guitar riff kicks this thing off and then it sounds like somebody's banging on the boiler room pipes I don't know if you're going to find Mankind back there or whatever, but you hear... Or Lars this, Ulrich it, making yeah, insane it, anger. Yeah, this, this was a precursor to it, except thankfully it didn't dominate the drum sound. It was just uh, you know filler stuff in the back. Th- this track is actually... I think that's the appropriate ro- word for me. This is a bit of a filler track for me. I think it's just kind of on there. The chorus has a little bit of a Nevermore vibe, in my opinion, and I think that it provides kind of a nice contrast from the onslaught that is the the verses which is just riffage um but not not one of my favorite tracks i think it's kind of just there and i think that the front end of the album is definitely stronger there there are two or three tracks on the back end which i did enjoy but for the most part we, we get into some of the uh dead spots for me sorry keith well but i think that's kind of what he said i mean he said it in more of the fact that like i his exact words were <laughs> After the five songs, you get a bit of a break in the middle to calm yourself with the next three songs. There, I just want to point out nothing about these three songs are calming. I would not know <laughs> right, the, the word I would use. Like maybe that was his. Night. Go ahead. I was going to say during Dog Day Sunrise, I felt my blood pressure rising to levels that were calm. Would not be the word I would want to use. I wanted to take my phone and throw it across would you, the room. Because would I you say it. ferociously calm, perhaps? Oh, that, see, that's exactly it's exactly right, Brad Bryant. If you're out there listening, we we, I, we, I think, we love you. I think maybe Keith was trying. The, that was a nice way of saying like, I he didn't he doesn't like these songs as much as the first five, and then the the preceding three or the uh, the three that come after. Um, all I could think of was this could have been the theme music to the tag team of Jesse Ventura and Greg Valentine that we never. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it body hammer um i think i think even i, I think as a, as a as a rhythm and blues guy i'm not sure that body hammer would have would have done the trick but nonetheless flashpoint maybe the honky track, hammer there you go flashpoint is i think a better song not great but better it does have like changes of pace throughout the song and the drumming here is awesome once again and for a change, I thought the, vo- the the screaming vocals are actually very, very well placed and tailor made for the song. Um, I, I think it provides kind of a, a little bit of a let up and a segue to what winds up being a very, very strong and aggressive end of the album. The last three tracks. Uh, I liked that the beginning of the song actually showcased a bit of the the bass, which yeah. was played by God knows who. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no idea. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, I, I, again, like, I think you hit the nail on the head. This one's another kind of a a quick one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm with Keith that the last three tracks definitely, um, are an improvement over the three tracks that, uh, preceded them. Um, yeah, I kind of feel like this is kind of in the, the, the kind of short, more fillery kind of area. Yeah, no, no question. And we got to the next track and I remember seeing it 
on the album track listing. It's called H-K Hunter Killer. Having known nothing about this band or this song, I had a feeling that this song would wind up being like a fan favorite. And again, I'm just basing it on the title. I don't know why I thought this, um, but there was something about the name where I'm like, people are going to gravitate towards this song if it's halfway decent. And I got to be honest, it actually is quite good. There's these ambient keyboard sounds in certain spots that I absolutely love. The verses are very heavy, but melodic. And, and they're actually some of the, I think some of the best verses on the, on the entire album. And the vocals and the pacing almost have a bit of a rap-like quality to it, I think. Um, if I hadn't chosen, um, you know, self-bias as my song of the week, this would have been it. This is a really cool track and I liked it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Um, I couldn't get out of my head. We had an inside joke in college. Um, we used to play Tecmo Bowl, uh, a lot in our living room. We had a big screen TV and I brought my NES and we found a copy of Tecmo Bowl at like game GameStop for like, two dollars or something three dollars whatever and boy we got our money's worth probably in the first week but um so after you win a game or whatever there's a newspaper article that (laughs) comes up on the screen but being that it was an nes game they didn't actually try to like fill the newspaper with anything like real information or printing so it just says hk 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 <laughs> over and over and over across the entire page and uh my friend mike uh different mike than the one we usually talk about would just randomly in the middle of a party just come up to me and just like go put his face right in my ear and just go hk 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 <laughs> so Try, try not thinking about that while listening to the song. Song's good too, on, you know. As as long as we're still talking about music and not tech mobile, <laughs> um, it's. But does it does it top a song called Piss Christ? Um, th- this <laughs> th- this song is very industrial, very progressive in spots, repetitive, catchy enough. I happen to actually like the clean vocals a lot during the choruses, and and also it's a touch slower before what can only be considered one of the weirdest outro tracks that I've ever heard in my life. A touch, uh, it's called, what you would call it, um, a therapy for pain. Kind of just lumping the two songs together. It's almost like a 10 minute closing track with a Megadeth-ish intro. And then it just stays slow and plotting and repetitive, but the orchestration builds over time. And it's a weird track, but I guess it's well-placed and kind of just takes you out of, of the element, if you will. What are your thoughts on these last two tracks and how the album ends? Because it is kind of a unique way to end an album. I, I like whatever the whatever the like sound effect that they're using in in Piss Christ. And now that I've said that song title out loud, I'm waiting for uh, Brother Steven to come <laughs> back from Chaminade and take my diploma away from me. Um <laughs> I, I don't know how to explain what that sound is. Um, it's but it's it's cool. It, it sounds almost like a video game kind of uh, sound effect or whatever. I mean, this is just a really cool, like aggressive, like uh, this is. I feel like if if I had ever uh, set foot inside of a gym, um, I might want to listen to a song <laughs> like this to get me motivated. Um, there's some cool like. Uh, like echoey vocals and uh it's a pretty cool su- song i'd probably say it was um one of my favorites on the album if not my my favorite you know what what the hell i'll, I'll call it my uh my song of the week I, if i'm gonna piss off the entire uh marianist brotherhood i might as well just do it <laughs> do it do it right Why? 
Piss Christ, song of the week. Yeah, here we go. Words you never thought you'd hear on this podcast, for sure. How about that last track, which kind of takes it takes you out? Um, it's so different. It's almost ten minutes long. It's it's just basically just this slow plotting progression, like I mentioned. Do you have any thoughts on this? Because it was very different from the rest of the album. Th- this really reminded me of an '80s new wave song that was like metalized, that was like huh. industrial metalized. Because I. I'm a big fan. I actually recently discovered um, XM Sirius has a station that kind of sticks to like 80. It's mostly 80s alternative, which almost is entirely made up of new wave songs. Man, I, I, I must have been kind of too young to appreciate it. But there there's a lot of good stuff from that era of, of music. Um, and this is kind of it reminded me of like like Tears for Fears on like you know, uh, on like antidepressants. <laughs> Maybe I've never heard the way. that analogy, but I love but, it. And I happen to be a Closet Tears for Fears fan. I think their new album is quite good. I, I, whenever I'm in a supermarket and I hear one of their songs, I quietly mark out. I think they're fantastic. But yeah, yeah the second the second thing. half of the song is like a tribute to the Undertaker's 30 year career. Like all of a sudden, like so, you have like this real atmospheric first half that again is like this new wave meets, you know, industrial metal. And then this whole second half is like this dirge, um, this like, this just like funeral march. Um, I, I, I honestly, I love this as the last song because it's like the, I feel like it's the only song on the album that actually has a sense of calm <laughs> that Keith used to describe uh, tracks six, seven, and eight, which I, I think, no offense to Keith, was not the right word to use. But um, <laughs> this is the one where I feel like it's it's kind of a depressing calm, but a calm nevertheless. Um, I was like shocked when I got up to it. And I was like, "What? This is all like one nine nine plus minute song." Like uh, this, it was kind of surprising after ten songs that really just like were real heavy. Um, I don't think there was even anything I would consider like mid tempo, like all t- the first 10 songs are like really pretty fast and heavy. And then, and then this is like, Oh, okay. Um, but I, I, it was welcome. It was like, I didn't need to hear an 11th piss Christ. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, how, how can I add anything to that? I think you're exactly right. It, the album needed something like this and, you know, I think it, it's fitting at the end. I think if you would have thrown it somewhere in the middle, it would have taken you out of the flow, so to speak. You know, what, what can I say? This, this is this album is widely regarded by fans of the band as their you know quintessential album, their best album, if you will. And and from what I understand, even though they would depart from this sound, there were efforts to kind of go back to it, but they never quite caught the magic again. But I, I'm I'm for, I for one am thrilled that we got to cover it because it was something I would have never, ever listened to, but for the request scale of one to 10, what, what are you giving this? Um, you know what? I'm going to give it a, I'm going to give it a 6.75. Um, I, I, I'll be honest. I, I didn't think I would like it as much as I did. Um, it, again, it's not, I think I, I'm basically saying the exact same thing I said about the first Sabbath album. Like it's not really my favorite, thing in the world my favorite type of music but you know i wasn't really expecting to like it and it ended up being pretty enjoyable i almost feel bad rating it under a seven when keith said that like it's his favorite album ever and again um nostalgia is a big a big factor in a, in a lot of things. And, and when you see what's, what album I choose for next week, you'll, you'll understand why I say that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and like, I always like to say, uh, add a little caveat, like this is something I could see myself enjoying more as time goes on. I, I could see myself going back to this and, and being like, Oh yeah. Remember that one week where we listened to like a, a very strange outlying type of album uh compared to most of what we talk about on this yeah, podcast. I, well said. Um if you would have asked me after that third listen, what do I rate this? 
I'm not sure that it would have registered. I think the number would have been very, very, very low. I mean, very low. It definitely grew on me. I, I'm going to give it a six, but from where it was, it is definitely trending in the right direction. And I'm kind of curious to hear some of their lesser known or lesser um, acclimated, not acclimated, but like acclaimed albums, because I'm just curious to see how their sound kind of changed and what they were going for, like what kind of you know sound they were they were trying to achieve. I don't – here's what I can say about this. I know the score is low. I actually don't think I'm finished playing with it. I want to spend some more time with it just on the side because there was enough here that, to your point, when I go to the gym, I could see myself queuing this up and really getting into it. So I'm going to, I'm going to, leave, it, I'm going to leave it on my phone. I'm not going to take it off just because I want to have it in my, in my rotation. I, I think that's, that's – uh... Very fair. I mean, also, like, I just, you know, want to point out again that, like, just the entire genre on a whole is something that I, I, that I, I, I speak for myself and, and I'm just guessing in your case is not something that you're super familiar with anyway. So there's kind of that part of it, too, where you're kind of opening up your your mind to, like, a totally different style. And, you know, I, I always harp on the fact that, like, me, to me, heavy metal has the most subgenres of any genre of music. There's just so many types and, and sure enough, you know, different from each other. Yeah. I mean, I have like, I have over, I think, Oh God, uh, I have over 230 genre types in my iTunes wow. and more than half of them are probably subsections of metal. Um, and I think this was a new one for me. Uh, adding uh, when I added this uh, this album, um, I I think I added them as let's see, uh, industrial groove metal. So I there think that's go. a first. It's a first for me. Um, but yeah, uh, it was cool to listen to, and um, I definitely would like to hear more. And, and I thank uh, I thank Keith for um, requesting something that we you know had at least some interest in actually listening to. Um, I. <laughs> I, God's honest truth, I thought before I listened to this, we might have a contender for, for worse than Anthrax, but um, Anthrax still remains my my uh, bottom bottom of the barrel uh, album of everything that we've discussed uh, up to this point. Um, not that not that I hated it. It's just, I think it's become like this running joke that I hated the album. I just thought it was very middling because... I mean, I don't think I gave it less than a five, which means that I found it average, if not slightly above average, but it's just that I haven't ranked anything else that low yet. And uh, in all honesty, I would have rather listened to this Fear Factory album than go back and listen to that Anthrax album again. Um, now I feel like my goal is to find an album that you like markedly less than Anthrax and see if you I can might need to it. find something that's not a metal album. <laughs> We haven't done a lot of black metal on this show, yeah. so we'll 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 we'll, we'll get there. Um, if you pick but, a country album, you might have a shot. <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned that. I, I I will be requesting something in another week or so, so I, I look forward to that. But no, uh, just a couple of news items before I, I hear your selection for the week, and you've piqued my curiosity to say the least. Uh, Christopher Hall, vocalist for Stabbing Westwood, a band that I was not really familiar with, um, but I know that we've had our friend Mike just loves this band he, he's been diagnosed with throat cancer whenever you hear that somebody has throat cancer it's extremely sad for obvious reasons but whenever you hear it for a singer uh, it's just extra tragic so um my condolences to him i hope he's uh, able to kick out of this thing sooner rather than later and um that's another band that i think is actually kind of in this time period in this genre of just not as heavy as, as fear factory obviously but it has like a little bit of an industrial sound from that mid-90s era yeah, um, I've always kind of I consider them more of like um, industrial alt. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe closer to Nine Inch Nails. Um, but I, um, between Mike and Knops, both of them had always uh, sp uh, spoken very highly. And the few songs that I do know, I I like a lot. Um, I actually would probably rather listen to Stabbing Westward than um, Fear Factory. In all honesty, I, it resonates a little bit more with me um but uh yeah I, I really do hope that um that he uh can uh you know bounce back from this and be okay because uh, like you said like for a singer that's got to be such a such a gut punch i mean cancer is a nightmare 
regardless, but for it to like get you right in your right in your money maker, if you will, it's 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 just such a bummer. So you know, thoughts and prayers, and we hope that we haven't uh, heard the last from stabbing westward. Exactly, exactly. Well said. Uh, And then finally, uh, some news out of the Behemoth camp. Speaking of heavy bands that I love, they released a new single called The Deathless Sun. It is from their new album, which is Opus Contra, not from out coming out on September 16th. I love this band. They are heavy as hell and they are just, I don't know, uh, music personified to my ears, but, uh, but something I just really resonates with me. Uh, the single is phenomenal. I will try to post that this week as well. Uh, and also just, like I said, their new album comes out, which means that September I will be listening to this thing and maybe we'll cover it because I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I was going to say, I, I know pretty much nothing uh, from a band that is, you know, popular than more popular than most of the bands that I listen to. So I think I, I would definitely be interested in, uh, checking out any of their albums, new or old, just to give give myself a little bit more of uh, familiarity because that's just one of those bands that, uh, much like um, Mastodon that we did a few weeks ago, another like you know real big name band that I just lacked the knowledge in. So uh, I put Behemoth in that same uh, camp. So that would be that would be cool. I would I would like to definitely check that out mostly because i i don't really know what the hell i would even expect to hear in all honesty i i'm literally adding it to my list of, of stuff just so i don't forget to choose it in the not so distant future um but with that it, it is actually your choice or i should say your your selection for next week so what are we listening to uh so this is going to be one where i think i'll be i'm going to be stealing your thunder because I know for a fact that this is something that you have wanted to talk about, but we, for whatever reason, have put it off for a while. Um, it's going to be probably in the conversation for the least listened to episode that we do because <laughs> of the, because of just how I think obscure this band is and how, and also the fact that they don't actually exist anymore. Uh, I'm talking about Twilightning and their debut album, Delirium Veil, which came out in 2003. Um, the, the first four songs on this album are like four of my all time favorite power metal uh, songs. I, I don't stop you right there. It's not the first four, it's like the first eight. I'll be, I'll be, I'm being honest well, with you. Well, I, I, I don't just know. one. I don't know that the rest of the album as well as those first four songs. I love those. And maybe uh, if I listen to it, it's been a while. If I listen to it again, it'll jog my memory. But um, I, I mean, if the rest of the album is as good as the first four tracks, then this is like one of the greatest power metal albums ever. I oh, know. I'm going to say it right now. This is low key one of the best power metal albums ever made. And, and in terms of um, under the radar or bands that nobody talks about, this might be the best underrated album of all time. Like that's how much I, 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 I the esteem which I hold this album in. I also have a a challenge for you that goes along with this episode. Um, Go for it. I, I I challenge you to get us an interview <laughs> with a member of this band. Um, so I actually spoke with the singer about a year ago. This is not a joke. I had reached out to him. I don't even remember why, but I think I had a question about something or another and I found him on Facebook. I think they've put this behind them because none of these guys are doing anything anymore, but I will reach back out as, 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 uh, and open up those lines of communication again and I'll see what I can do. I, I just think that would be absolutely fascinating to about four people and half and two of them <laughs> would be me and you. Um, I know um, Anthony DeCrisantis, uh also holds this album in very high regard. So there's a third person I think that will enjoy this. Um, I mean, in all honesty, like if you like power metal, this is going to be right up your alley. Cause um, at a time where I wasn't as into metal, this was something that you turned me on to and it just a lot like 
Dragon Force did a few years, a couple of years before, it just knocked me right off my my feet. And and unfortunately, they just didn't follow up. And, and we'll talk about it at length. But um, I, I just I'm, I'm really shocked that um, you didn't pick this album in our like first 100 episodes uh so, so I, deci- many albums. I decided to beat you to the punch yeah I, I and i appreciate it because i i could listen to this album in perpetuity and i would never get tired without kind of bearing the, you know i'm not bearing the lead here but like there's something you know there's so many albums and there's so many bands and there's so much we have to cover that like it just got kind of got pushed back and there were times where i said oh i'm gonna select it and then i wound up chose you know choosing something else Great choice. Look forward to listening to it and look forward to um, playing it on, on repeat this week. I, I definitely will. And uh, I appreciate the challenge. I'm going to do I'll my t- best I'll, and see what I'll I can tell do. You, I'll tell you why I'm so interested in speaking to a member of this band. Because I want to know how a bunch of people come together, put together a, a just a killer debut and then just fall right off the fucking face of the planet excuse my french um it's it's just mind-boggling to me um it's i don't know i am just curious like what happened and um like wh- why i i know like we both shared the opinion that the follow-up album was was re- like a, a real disappointment compared to this one, the, um, the follow-up album has some. Again, we'll get into this next week. The follow-up album has some good songs on it. It's just it's not the quality of the debut, and I think that the third album is not good. But it, you can see the the rapid decline over the course of just a couple of years. But I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm curious as well how they've just. And, and it's funny because, like I said, I don't think any of these guys are doing much in the way of music at this point themselves anyway. Um, fair questions, and 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 hopefully we can get them answered because I I share the questions that you have. Yeah, I want to know how they went from at the forge to sex jail. Um, well, that's <laughs> I mean I could probably venture a guess, but I'm 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 not going to do that because I don't want to get t- uh, brought up on slander charges. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite the it's it's quite the change, and and definitely something that. Um, I've been wondering for, for the better part of 20 years or, or, or thereabouts. So great choice. Look forward to hearing it. Um, and, and with that, I, I want to hear those uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, songs. So <laughs> send them to me and we'll call it a week. And uh, I look forward to wrapping, uh, you know, keep basically catching up with you next week and talking about some Twilightning. Yeah. Uh, Keith, thanks again for the request. Um, we're definitely uh, going to do Stain Anger. I think it's going to be our episode 500 special. Um, so, <laughs> Just hang in there. Uh, it's coming. We just have to do every other album by every other band first. <laughs> except except for Lulu. <laughs> Enjoy the week, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good one.